So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we have a lot of very exciting presentations this year, and uh, I'm proud to introduce Dr. Vance Fowler. He's the Associate Professor of Tenure in the Department of Medicine, and uh, he's currently actually the PI on one of our projects. Uh, we're doing a uh, pretty important large study of uh, bacteremia study, uh, which uh, gives us an opportunity to work very closely with Dr. Fowler. And uh, so, um, actually, I uh, don't think there's anything else except to uh, turn things over to him. And um, thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. So, so the... Um, the time, what is the timeline? How, how much time do I have and what's the, how do things work? Usually uh, speak for about 45 minutes to an hour. And okay. There's a half hour for questions. Okay. But if you like, people can ask questions uh, as you go along. It's up to you. Uh, they, why, don't we, uh, why don't we start off by asking questions as we go along and, uh, you know, if you guys have got questions, just um, hit me with them and I can't guarantee I, I know the answer, but I can, I can guarantee I'll try. Um, all right, so I, let's see. I, I, disclosures. This is a uh, we'll just discuss commercial products that are in services and potentially off-label uh, product use. Can't remember my disclo uh, disclosures are all listed here in terms of funding. I'm required to show that. Okay, so. Um, this is a talk that I've, that I've done as sort of a, an introductory talk for pr general practitioners, and um, I'm um, going to go over some of these, these key points in greater detail and some of them in lesser detail. My objectives at the end of the, of the uh, presentation would be to that you have sort of a nodding familiarity of the fact that staff force is bad, uh, and that it's bad in a variety of ways, that it can cause... Um, uh, human infection in, in multiple different ways. That's important Sorry, because none of you have reached. Uh, from a clinical standpoint, it's important because there are a number of ways that you really have to uh, consider uh, Staph aureus. It's also important because um, from a clinical trial standpoint, it's 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 not it's very difficult to do just a trial on just staff you know a staff trial there really isn't one and the implications of for example staph aureus bacteremia in terms of how you design your trial are dramatically different from the it, those implications of a, a trial on staphylococcal pneumonia for example all right so I'm going to start off just by sort of going over um, Staph aureus disease. So, there, it can again, it, it's a diverse problem. It causes trouble in a lot of different ways. It actually produces proteins, um, toxins, that can cause uh, disease. So it can cause toxin-mediated disease. There are basically three forms of this toxin-mediated disease: uh, enterotoxins, which are essentially food poisoning. And the classic thing is uh, with, with staphylococcal food poisoning is uh, potato salad uh, because of the dairy products. And typically what happens, you know, eight hours, ten hours after you go, you go to a, you know, a picnic where the, the potato salad has been out a little bit longer than it should have been and, you know, and then you get nausea and vomiting and you feel like you feel terrible for a while, but it gets better. Um, there's a thing called scalded skin syndrome, which this is an example. This is a child from, from Duke from I don't know, several years ago. It's terrifying. I mean, obviously, this is a horrifying presentation. The good news, thankfully, is that it, it actually has a really good prognosis. This one, uh, the only other thing you think about with this is a, a, a thing called toxic epidermal uh, ne necrolysis, which is fatal. So uh, as horrifying as this is, I mean, particularly those of us with children, uh, the, the, the good news, if there is such, is that it's going to get better. <clears throat> and then toxic shock syndrome. And this is, you know, this one I think probably most of us are familiar with. It, we really became aware of it in the ni early 1980s with the, uh, uh, the tampon-associated toxic shock syndrome. Um, 
It's interesting now with increased awareness and, and sort of sophistication and advances of, uh, in terms of, uh, of the field that uh, fully half of the cases of toxic shock syndrome in the United States now are non-menstrual. You know, there's a wound associated. Um, basically, what you're talking about is a staff voice gets inside a wound during, during or around the time of surgery. Postoperatively, these folks don't do well. They get real, real sick in a, in, in a hurry. Um, and the wound looks normal. So, and the treatment is debridement of the wound. So, it, there, there's all, there, you can imagine uh, asking the surgeon to take an acutely ill person back to the OR to debride a wound that looks perfectly normal can be um, uh, tense, to say the least. Um, so, it, so, okay, so it can call, staphylococcal disease can cause, uh, um, uh, can be caused by toxin-mediated process. I'm going to spend a lot of time on direct invasion and, and bloodstream infection for several reasons. One, because in terms of the clinical need, it's by far the greatest. Two, it's the trial that we, we currently are, you know, undertaking an NIH-funded trial on bloodstream infection uh, here, and, and you all, many of you all are, are playing pivotal roles in, in uh, in, in moving it forward. So that's where I'm going to spend a lot of time. So the big question, staph aureus bacteremia, you know, whenever you've got staph aureus in your blood, um, the key question is, is it complicated or uncomplicated? And they're essentially buckets. Basically, um, as, as, I, as you'll see, there are a whole lot of different ways you can have complicated infection. Um, but the treatment concepts, in terms of extended course of therapy, in terms of need to go to the OR, things like that, are more or less the same. So complicated and uncomplicated. It seems like a very easy dichotomy, but in, in practice, it's often pretty difficult to, to, to differentiate. So for the purposes of uncomplicated, catheter-associated staph or bacteremia, which is really part of the... Uh, of the um, patient population that is actually involved in this bacteremia trial that we were fortunate enough to, to be able to, per, per, to participate in. Uh, there are a whole, this is a whole long list. The point of this slide is that it's, it's hard to have uncomplicated catheter-associated staph or bacteremia. The majority of folks don't, okay? You can, and it matters because you can treat them uh, less aggressively. You can sh treat them for shorter courses of antibiotics. You could potentially get them out of the hospital sooner. You, need, you can avoid doing a lot of these diagnostic procedures. So that's the advantage. And if you can find that group, the sort of who's going to do well, uh, there's a lot of reasons, that there's a lot of, of pragmatic benefits to the patient and to the healthcare system. The problem is that in order to get to uncomplicated disease, they've got to, have, they've got to meet a whole lot of characteristics. Uh, so it's hard to have uncomplicated disease. Um, by contrast, it's pretty easy to have complicated infection. So almost 40% of patients with staph or bacteremia at, at, at our institution at Duke um, and, and, and most places have complicated infection. Um, one of the big questions is how do you know? How does the clinician at the bedside know? who you have to worry about, who you have to order these thousands of dollar tests on, who you have to, uh, you know, send back to the operating room, take the devices out, all this stuff. And so that was something that, this is a paper I did, I started this work when I was an intern, actually, a first year resident, a medical resident here in 1994. And I started collecting this clinical, these, basically the database on every patient who had staph aureus bacteremia over at Duke. Um, and I, so from 1994 until now, it's still ongoing, and we've collected all, in excess of 2,000 patients now, prospectively collected them, stored their isolates, um, collecting things like uh, DNA from them now. Uh, but the, the big question was, is there some way that you can identify who's got complicated and who's got uncomplicated disease? And there, the short answer was yes, there's some things that sort of tip you to worry more. If they have staff that comes in from the community, that's an important risk factor for having complicated infection. This is not an infection that just sort of arises out of nowhere. 
if you've got staph in your blood, there's a source somewhere. And the, key, and the question for the clinician is, where is it? If you've got it in the community, it, then you've got complicated disease. If you have persistent fever, then there's a source somewhere. Um, and, and from a clinical standpoint, you've got to keep looking for it. Um, if you have persistent bacteremia, so in other words, you draw a blood culture at time zero, and then two to four days later, somewhere in that period, you draw it again, and you have staph aureus again, that's a clue. That's a huge clue that, that you're missing something. <clears throat> and the, it, it, it doesn't tell you where it is, but it tells you you've got to keep looking. And it means adding additional tests, ordering the diagnostic procedures, et cetera. And then devices. So the intersection between... Uh, or, or the, you know, obviously you all have, have been in, participated in many of these device-associated trials. Um, the use of prostheses in fields like cardiology and orthopedics uh, have ch changed and, and improved and, and extended the, the lives of countless thousands of patients until they get infected. And this intersection between prosthesis and infection is really an ever-widening one uh, for which there is no good therapy in, in contemporary medicine. Standard of care at this point is if the, if the device is infected, you take it out. If you want the infection to go away, you gotta take the, you got to make the device go away. And if it's a, just a catheter or something, that's one thing. But if you're talking about a pacemaker or a defibrillator or a prosthetic valve, an artificial hip, I mean, the, the, this is, obviously this has a catastrophic impact on the patient. You don't want to do these things unnecessarily, but if it's infected, the only way it's going to go, the infection is going to go away is for the device to go away. So if you can identify up front who it is that you've got to worry about, everybody wins. All right, so now I'm just going to kind of go through a litany of, of different examples of, of complicated staphylococcal disease. Um, and the point of this, I think, from this section of the slides is really to, sh to if make the point that um, it comes in multiple flavors. It's sort of a, you know, Baskin Robbins kind of thing rather than just... Uh, so, for the, the most dreaded one is, is infective endocarditis. This is a, 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 a mitral valve of a patient that, was, uh, that had a, a endocarditis here at Duke and had, had it, the valve resected and went on to have a, a valve replacement and, and survived. Big question is, so, you know, what do you know if you have staph horse in your blood and you have a, what is your likelihood of endocarditis? And this is a question that comes up with every single case of staph horse bacteremia. Do they have endocarditis? Because endocarditis is kind of the ultimate complicated disease, if you will. Untreated, you will die. And even properly treated, even with standard, you know, state-of-the-art care, the mortality of staph or uh, endocarditis is on the order of about 30%. So about one in three of folks will die even with the best possible care. So what you know is that um, if they have a native valve, just the fact that they have staph or in their blood without actually seeing the patient, their risk of endocarditis is about one in eight. It's about 12%. <clears throat> and that's been reported over and over. Um, if you have a prosthetic valve, that is, you have staph horse in your blood and you have a prosthetic valve in your body. The rate of, in, of that valve being infected is almost half. It's 40%. So it's a big problem. Okay? Clini absence of proof doesn't equal proof of absence. So clinical exam is not sufficient to rule it out. You can have a normal exam and still have, you can still have endocarditis. And that's, uh, that is important because it means you've got to use other tools. So, and, 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 and a variety of these are, in essence, different types of echo. These tools to help uh, substantiate or buttress the clinical exam is echo, transesophageal or transthoracic. So these are data that, you know, we published uh, a couple of years ago. Um, demonstrate looking at endocarditis from throughout the world. This is the ICE data, International Collaboration on Endocarditis. It was, it's housed here at, at the DCRI. Uh, Tina Harding and uh, uh, Cola Baylock and, and uh, others uh, work on it uh, and have kept this thing going. It's, a, it's a, uh, just one of the many uh, sort of gems that are m maybe under-recognized here at the DCRI. Uh, this, is, this, is, this database has prospectively collected data on almost 5,000 prospectively collected patients with endocarditis from... Um, 
At, at that point, it was 16. It's now 28 countries and 60 centers. So you can really get an idea of what is going on with endocarditis. The problem with endocarditis traditionally has been it's common enough for everyone to think they're an expert, that they know everything about it, but it's uncommon enough that, no, that, that few people actually are. And so you can, you know, the traditional publication history on it has been single center, often retrospective, case of 50 patients here, 30 patients here. So if you, what you really need to do to kind of get the, you know, it's sort of like the, the fable, the Hindu fable of the blind men describing the elephant, you know, where there are the different parts of the, and some of them are describing the trunk and the tusk and the foot. And, you know, no one would say that any of those descriptions are wrong, but at the same time, I think none of us would, would also, would, similarly, none of us would say that, uh, you know, the description of the tusk or, the, or just the, the foot fully captures the elephant. So the point of this is that, sta that you know, when you actually looked at it in, in uh, uh, the gold standard tool, there was one key message, and that staph aureus is now the most common cause of infective endocarditis in the industrialized world. A primary reason for that is, um, um, let's see, could, uh, yeah, or maybe if I could just call, or just, if maybe just ask someone to, would you, Matt, would you mind just calling this number and telling them that I'll call them back, that I'm giving a lecture and then I'll call them. They've called twice in the same numbers. I don't, I'm not sure what that's all about. Um, thanks a lot. So, um, okay. Coag negative staff, I think we'll just we'll leave that off. These are other data from ICE. I, I think to keep the message simple, I'm going to focus on treatment of a native valve endocarditis is essentially um, uh, is well established. These are data in uh, treatment guidelines that uh, I helped co-author a few years ago. Um, I think what I'm going to try, yeah, I'm going to move on to this. These are also data from ICE, and this is uh, Andrew Wong uh, uh, was the first author in this paper. Uh, and the, the key message here is that not only is staph aureus the most common cause of endocarditis in native valves, but it's also the most common cause of endocarditis in prosthetic valves. This is, a, a, again, this is a sea change. This is, brand, this is a, a fundamental shift of our traditional understanding. Of, uh, of endocarditis, <clears throat> and it's relevant because uh, staph aureus is worse than what we traditionally understood. Uh, traditionally, this was a thing called coagulase negative staphylococci, which is sort of the sort of a less virulent cousin of staph aureus, if if you want to call it that. Um, all right, we'll leave that off. We'll leave that off. We'll leave that off. Here we go. Oh, so, so yeah, take so oh, lugdunensis. No, this is a really interesting thing, but I, I'm not going to go into it. Um, let me. I'm trying to make the message because you know I'm sort of balancing this stuff that I think is absolutely fascinating, but I got to realize that you know for the vast majority of the world they may not think it's quite so fascinating. My wife reminds me of that <laughs> on regular uh, opportunities. Um, let, so let, but I, let me just get so the message, so the key message you get through. So staph aureus and endocarditis. Staph, the key messages. Staph aureus is common and diverse. It's now the most common cause of both native and prosthetic valves. That has pa a significant impact um, across whatever medical field in, you, you find yourself because of prognosis and because of treatment. Staph aureus patients infected, you know, endocarditis, they do worse. They need more surgery, and they're still more likely to die. Um, risk factors. You know, I, I've, I've seen the enemy, and he is me kind of thing. The primary risk factor for this C change in, in the carditis is healthcare contact. So if you actually look at these patients of who's getting staph aureus, they're persons who've had contact with, you know, guys like me, you know, that have come into the healthcare system and they're getting some sort of intervention. They're getting catheters, they're getting devices, they're getting surgical wounds, and these life-saving interventions paradoxically pre put them at risk of superinfection, of getting infected with staph aureus. 
in large part because they allow the bacteria to kind of bypass the uh, you know host defenses. So I would say to you all, yeah, I mean, well, if if you do, first of all, it's it's you know if you have loved ones and all that go into the healthcare system, I personally I think it's absolutely critical to have a family member in the room. I really do believe that. I interact differently with them, and when my own crew have been in the hospital, I've made sure that's the case. So, but the other thing is, you know, people, if, if I don't wash my hands when I come in, you don't see me wash my hands, it's okay to ask me if I've washed my hands. It really is. You should feel empowered with that because it's, it, 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 you know, it's, um, well, it, it's, it's an unnecessary risk that we subject the patient to. So on a personal level, I would say, feel for, I think you should feel comfortable to ask the physician or the healthcare provider if they've washed their hands. And I can tell you, it's only going to take them once for them to, to, to get embarrassed to, to get them, make them better the next time. All right, uh, that's a question. Okay, so that's, oh yeah, that's, which is the most common cause of bacterial etiology in the world? Staph aureus. Um, all right, drugs, we're not going to go into that. Here we go. So we're going to move on to the next form of complicated disease. All right, so where are we? We're talking about staph aureus in your blood. It's a risk factor. One of the, the big issue is complicated versus uncomplicated. There are a lot of flavors of complicated, right? There are multiple different ways. So this is a second kind. This is, uh, pardon me, vertebral osteomyelitis. And basically, this is an infection, a, a bony infection of your spine. So the staph aureus gets into your blood, goes round and round, for reasons we don't fully understand, lands in your spine, and sets up and establishes an infection. So this is a tough one. Uh, I just saw a guy in clinic yesterday. This is a young, healthy, fit guy, marathoner. He and I'd run some of the same races together. Came up, came in, no medical problems. Came in out of the blue, staph aureus in his blood, and vertebral osteomyelitis. And he had bacteremia for over three weeks. He darn near died. But we cured him and discharged him from clinic yesterday. Took a year and a half to do it. But uh, this is a tough diagnosis to make. Um, and and it, here's the trouble right here. So this is the spine. Just to orient you, this is sort of cut the person sideways. The belly button's forward. The bottom, you know, is down here and going that way. Head up here, feet down there. That's the spine. And this, these are sort of more or less normal vertebral bodies, and that's trouble right there. Um, so the big complaint is pretty nonspecific back pain. So you go see these patients in the hospital bed, you know, lay in those hospital beds. Everybody's got back pain in those hospital beds, right? I mean, it's, you know, what are you going to, that's not going to help you. How do you find these darn folks? And the answer is, it's not easy. The reason is that you, in order to make the diagnosis, you got to think about it. And you've got, then you've got to order the right diagnostic test, which in this instance would be a CT of the spine or an MRI or something like that. But it's an expensive thing that you've got to send them down. It's going to take a day, all that. It's a big deal is the point. So for that reason, there's diagnostic delay. These are two different studies. One, this is Alan Jensen's paper from Denmark, and this is uh, McHenry from uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and, and both of these studies in two different parts of the world, two different healthcare systems, came down, had, had a more or less the same finding. Average time to diagnosis of this thing is a month, a month after onset of symptoms. Uh, and indeed, the, the gentleman I saw yesterday he was, a, a, you know, a, 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 just such a, had, had just such a situation. It took him over six weeks before someone finally made the right call. Um, Epi another kind of form of trouble, epidural abscess. This is actually the second most common cause of medical... Oh, there it is. I did put it in the slide. So epidural abscess. Just to orient you again, this is belly buttons over here, bottom there, feet on the floor, head up, spine. This is the spinal cord, this gray thing. And then this collection, this sort of crescent-shaped thing with the big red arrow pointing to it, that's an abscess that yields a pure growth of, of staph aureus when, when we ultimately send him to, to, to uh, surgery. Uh, but it's pressing against the spinal cord. Okay, so that's the problem. When you have an epidural abscess, it mashes against the spine, and, um, and you can end up with, you know, 
paraplegia and devastating neurologic complications. Um, it's a hard diagnosis to make. It's not that common. About two and a half percent. So three out of a hundred patients with staph aureus will have it. You as a clinician, as a primary care guy, you know, out there, you know, in the in the dock in a box kind of thing and all, you may see one of these in your entire career. How are you going to know that? You know, how can, can you know, when do you sus suspect it? And the answer is it's tough. Uh, diagnostic delay is common. Um, about, in fact, one study, almost half of the patients that came in with this procedure or this, uh, di this complication, um, their, their admitting diagnosis didn't even relate to the spine. So they had a spinal epidural abscess. They got admitted, but they got admitted for something completely different. Um, uh, diagnosis MRI. And it's probably because of the diagnostic delay and the fact that people... It, this, this, this disease really hurts people uh, forever. Um, it's the second most common cause, ID cause of medical malpractice after uh, necrotizing fasciitis. Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. Uh, the answer is uh, uh, that blood cultures are helpful. Uh, you can have them both ways. In other words, you can have an epidural abscess with negative blood cultures. You can have um, blood. You can have uh, an epidural abscess with positive blood cultures. If it's staph aureus, you're more likely to have blood cultures. You know, so I think it's I don't know. It's over half. Probably 60 percent will have positive blood cultures with staph aureus epidural abscess. Uh, there are other forms of it that are, uh, that are less associated. But the thing about staph is it's not hard to grow. I mean, the good thing about it is it's not hard to grow. It's a tough organism. I mean, we keep we have thousands in our lab, in these, and we we from all over the world MRSA strains, and we um, the way we keep them when we want to take them out and play around with them, you know, and look for their genes and things, uh, we just put them in a minus 80 freezer. Kimberly knows this. She was one, she extracted DNA from them, and uh, for uh, for for several years before she moved over here, it probably scared her. Probably scared her into coming into clinical research and get out of that lab. But, but at any rate, um, so this it's a it's an easy thing to grow, uh, and and that's one tool to our advantage. Uh, but just having it out of the blood, all it tells you you've got a problem. It doesn't tell you where it is. Did you have a question? Um, yeah. Are there risk factors? I mean, I'm sitting here looking at these uh, symptoms, thinking, "Oh my God, I better get to the doctor. I might have uh, an epidural abscess." Uh, yeah. <laughs> are there are there risk factors? Uh, for epidural abscess, uh, yes, there are some. So, injection drug use. Uh, patients with injection drug use are at higher risk. Um, patients who've had surgery, uh, obviously, are at, at uh, uh, particularly spinal surgery, are at higher risk. And then, you know, again, identifying, you know, most of these folks, these folks, typically these folks are sick. You know, they're febrile and, and uh, um, it, this is, yeah, they're usually acutely ill. So, Vance, of the epidural abscess, would that be secondary seeding from the blood? Usually so, yeah. Yeah, you can get it multiple different ways. If you just had spinal surgery, uh, if you just had spinal surgery, then um, I'm not too close to your... Thing, is that um, then it's all, it can often be you know a post-operative complication, but but uh, yeah, in the absence of surgery, yeah, you got it. it. It came in from somewhere, a wound or some sort of break in your skin. You may never even know where the the break was, uh, and it gets in, and for reasons we don't really understand, it sets up shop in the tissue. You know, staph is this thing is it's a smart. It's a smart adversary. It's got these, it's sort of like a, you know, like a smart bomb kind of thing. You know, like on CNN where they used to have the pictures of the bomb going down that chimney uh, where it just kind of zones in. And Staph aureus really can do the same thing. It's got these proteins on the surface that it expresses more or less at will. It, you know, when it's, too, it's not will, but at, when the circumstances are appropriate, ideal for it to do it, it will express certain proteins that have, uh, on the surface of these proteins, receptors that bind to specific host tissues, like, for example, collagen, fibrinogen, fibrin, um, bone sialoprotein. These are things to which the, the, the bacteria, that allows the bacteria to specifically recognize certain host tissues and bind to them. Um, so, 
Vance, just a question. Do you think orthopedic surgeons um, look for this type of staph infection, or do they look at an MRI and mostly concentrate on the bone structure or nerves? Uh, yeah, I think people will, um, if the clinical context is right. I mean, I, you know, the spinal surgeons are very well familiarized with this problem uh, because they typically get consulted. Um, so, you know, the, in the appropriate clinical, con it's all about clinical context. You know, if, there's, if the person's got a fever and they're telling you they have a fever, and if they have staph or in their blood, then every, and, and you're ordering a study like this, question number one is, do they have a paraspinal infection? Um, the key question is getting to that. So once the test is done, you, it's easy. It's, it's the step before that. Uh, the, you know, the person in the ER or the person at the bedside sort of saying, why does this guy keep having fever and staph or is his blood and back pain? Oh, well, it must be the bed. That's the part. Yeah, that's where the connection doesn't hit. Uh, deep tissue abscesses, <coughs> same kind of thing. Um, you, can, you can present in lots of different ways. This is a brain abscess. This was a guy who had endocarditis and flicked off an, uh, an embolus to his brain, essentially established an infection there. He was discharged and went back home to his dialysis unit down in Dunn and then had a seizure and came back in. Um, uh, psoas abscess, that's this thing here. Whoops. Yeah, this thing right here. So it looks like a loop of bowel. So this is uh, heads up here, feet are down here, belly button there, bottom there, uh, spine. And this is sort of the muscles on the side of the spine. Basically, one of these muscles, like this right here, a relatively small muscular structure, has just developed this whomping abscess. And this that one we got, I got that one, I was a second year resident, and we got that abset, we got that MRI done on a Friday afternoon at the VA, uh, which is not an easy accomplishment, but we, I can, but it happened, and this, and we, they drained over 200 cc's of just pure pus out of that guy's back, but he did well, he survived. Um, this one here, so this is a, this is a different imaging, this is CT scan, the feet are facing you, um, the head is going into the wall, the belly button's to the ceiling and the bottom's towards the floor. This is the right side, it's the left side. These are the kidneys. And you can see this kidney's normal and this kidney is not normal. And this is a big abscess actually in the kidney um, that grew Staph aureus. So, um, so a variety of, basically, this, the Staph aureus can infect more or less any tissue in the, in the body. I wonder what this is. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Oh, there we go. Septic arthritis, bone and joint infection. So this is another lady. She was a, she's a, was a school teacher, an elementary school teacher from Fayetteville down in the eastern part of the state. And she came, into the, came in out of the community, no risk factors, nothing. Fever, staph horse in her blood, and she could not AB duck. She could not move out her, her left leg. And she had point tenderness right over her pelvis, her symphysis pubis. Um, which is, you know, that bone right there in the front of your pelvis. So just to orient you, feet towards you again, bottom down, bottom down belly button up here. Um, that's the rectum. These are the femoral, the, the, the femoral heads. That's the bladder. This is the symphysis pubis, and this is a big abscess that yielded a pure growth of Staph aureus. Um, this is a tough one. This is rare. You see one or two of these in a career, even as an ID person. Uh, and I've see her in clinic now and follow her up and she's doing great. Um, but you can get basically joint, you can, um, you can get staph aureus in joint spaces. And it probably has to do with the fact that they're very, fairly well vascularized, that it gets a good deal of blood flow. And then the synovial fluid, once it gets in there, the synovial fluid is more or less a sanctuary space that's with a lot of uh, essentially uh, culture media, you know, that it can grow in. And it can, most commonly it's the knee, but you can get it in the, you can get it anywhere. Sacroiliac joint, which is, you know, the back of your pelvis. Sternoclavicular joint up there in your clavicle. Symphysis pubis, et cetera. And the diag this is a, this is an orthopedic emergency. Because time equals cartilage. Uh, the longer it's in there, chewing away the cartilage, the less function you're going to have later. So, 
uh, embolic event. So if you've got staph horse in your blood and you've got endocarditis, one of the problems with endocarditis is it's got this vegetation and it kind of flails around in the, in the breeze, well, or in the bloodstream, and it can break off periodically. Uh, and then when it breaks off, this piece just kind of flies downstream and, and lands somewhere else. It can land in, your, you know, in the brain, you can have a stroke. Uh, if you can have it in the set, if it's on the right side, if it's tricuspid, then you can have these, these what they call septic pulmonary emboli, which is what you see here. Um, and if it's left-sided, you can get any a number of different situations. This particular one was a dialysis-dependent woman up on the eighth floor uh, who had aortic endocarditis and presented uh, it, uh, presented one afternoon with just acute, excruciating left upper quadrant pain. And um, the orientation is the same as before, feet towards you, uh, bottom towards the floor. This is her liver. This is her spleen. And this is a big splenic infarct from one of those emboli that flicked off and went into her spleen and uh, killed off that. She ended up losing her spleen and having her valve taken out. Um, cardiac device infection. So a lot of the... Uh, data with regards to the, this particular phenomenon was generated here at Duke. Um, we know that the risk of infection in Staph aureus is 28%, about one in four. So if you have a pacer in and you have uh, Staph aureus, your chances of having that pacemaker infected, but there are a whole lot of other subcategories, but it's at least one in four. So it's high is the message. Um, <clears throat> the rates have gone up dramatically. Um, the, uh, in large part, it has to do with the, the number of devices that are being implanted, um, the uh, number of sites that are uh, performing implantation, um, many with less experience than others, um, the, and the, the uh, patients in whom the devices are being implanted, so that these are persons at higher risk. They've got more dem demographic, you know, they've got more co comorbidities, and they're sicker folks. Um, and so this is a this is an, this is a lead. This is a cardiac lead. This is a, and that was implanted. And this is a huge vegetation. This is probably one of the biggest ones you'll ever see. And you can imagine, I think, that the, the difficulty that would be associated with trying to treat something like that medically. I mean, it's just not going to happen, uh, unfortunately. So yeah, I'll leave that off. Uh, so take home pay was back to remium. <clears throat> Uncomplicated versus complicated. That's the, it's as simple and as difficult as that. Um, if, you, if they're uncomplicated, great. Uh, you can treat them uh, with relatively straightforward courses of therapy. If they're not, then you got trouble. There are risk factors for complicated disease, persistent bacteremia and fever, community acquisition. Back pain plus staph in the blood, you need to worry about vertebral osteomyelitis. That doesn't mean you have to do a you have to do a CT scan on every single person who has staff who has back pain and staph aureus, but close. Um, you got to at least think about it. And if you can't explain why, you don't have a good explanation, then you, then you probably need to err on the side of of uh, a negative study. Uh, joint pain plus staph rule out septic arthritis, and a big issue there is tapping the joint. Uh, if you got leg weakness and incontinence and staph aureus, epidural abscess is big trouble. Staph plus Coronary, uh, cardiac device is trouble, usually in the form of an effective cardiac device, which necessitates removal. Um, and, and really, the only way to get rid of the, such infections is to get rid of the device. Uh, yeah. All right, here we go. Okay, invasive MRSA. So I think now what I'm it's been a while since I've looked at these slides. I think what I'm going to talk, what I'm talking about now is MRSA. This is a great study, in my view. It's gotten a lot of criticism, but that's ah, all right. If, if, if you don't... Can you just define for everybody what MRSA is? Not sure. everybody yeah, in the room may know it. Yeah, you bet. So, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So, this is the MRSA you've heard about in the news and, and you know, these resistant skin infections. <clears throat> methicillin-resistant Staph aureus is fundamentally the same as any Staph aureus, but it just happens to be resistant to a specific class of antibiotics, the penicillin class and the sort of the, that, that, that's the issue. That's really the only difference. We, um, it, it's important clinically because it really changes the way therapy is, is administered. 
Um, yeah. So this is a, this study was published in the JAMA in two, late 2007, and uh, it really, in my view, is a landmark paper in terms of making the point that MRI, invasive MRSA is a big problem nationally. You know, drug, uh, pharma caught onto this. Big pharma, even in the form of vaccine studies, has gotten this message right <clears throat> as well. They should, in my view. Um, but and it was a great study, a lot of data. This was a you know it was almost it was an eight-page JAMA paper, which means a lot of data. I'm, there are three key messages. The, basically, this paper, to my view, emphasized three things. One, invasive MRSA is common, so the incidence rate for invasive MRSA is 31.8 per 100,000 patients. Now, if you actually looked at persons over 65, the incidence rate exceeded 120 per 100,000 persons. Just to put that in, by way of putting that in context, many of the vaccine preventable infections, the incidence rates for, the, for various vaccine preventable infections for which you know, vaccines are currently available, for example, meningococcal vaccines, the pneumococcal vaccines, Haemophilus influenza, were lower than the 31.8. So this is a this is a big number, okay? This really hit uh, a, a sort of alarm bells down the CDC. Secondly, it's mainly healthcare associated. So it's, again, it's mainly associated with the with the the, uh, the hospital in some form or another. Now, although it's healthcare associated, the majority were acquired outside of the hospital. I think in part of this because of this finding. Uh, agencies like the AHRQ have just released an RFA looking at the acquisition of resistant pathogens in ambulatory care settings. So it, it, this whole phenomenon of people who get hospital-acquired infections outside of the hospital is it's very interesting. If you look at it, it's, it's, is a, um, it's a largely American phenomenon. If you look in other healthcare systems, for example, when we look with the ICE data, the characteristics of endocarditis in other parts of the world is dramatically different. You just don't see it. They still have similar rates of healthcare infection, but most of those infections are acquired actually in hospital. And is that because of the third party payers and the emphasis on sending people out? Yeah, I don't know. It's complicated. But the fact of the matter is it's there. So point one, it's common. Point two, it's mainly healthcare associated. And point three, it's serious. 75% of these infections were bacteremia. And we've just been talking about, you know, why that's a problem. So what do we do with it? Vancomycin uh, for invasive MRSA. You know, it's the mainstay antibiotic for invasive MRSA for over three decades. It's cheap, safe, available, and works. And... Uh, um, Drug, uh, you know, pharmaceutical representative spin to the contrary, no drug has yet been shown to be superior in an FDA registrational trial. I can't remember if I put the, the, the letter that the FDA uh, required Pfizer to submit in terms of their, because they, they had had an issue with regards to their, the way they presented this, sort of a mea culpa letter. But it's been addressed, I've begun to be addressed, I think. Problems with vancomycin, you know, largely I think it's fair to say that most clinicians use it because we have to and not necessarily because we want to, all right? Um, resistance is emerging. It's been uh, slow to arrive and uh, remains infrequent, but it has occurred. The, uh, the issue of um, is there sort of a relative... Uh, resistance, even in the strains that are susceptible, so that if some of these strains that are less susceptible to VANC, do they have it? Does it? Does that have an impact on outcome? That's a highly controversial uh, subject. Uh, Redman syndrome, not a real issue. Rash, thrombocytopenia, which your platelets go down. Nephrotoxicity, big, probably the the biggest one. And then dosing in obese individuals. <clears throat> this is a lot of data. Um, and uh, what's the point of the slide? That essentially, this is demonstrating sort of various flavors of vancomycin resistant and staph aureus. So, there, first of all, those penicillin resistant, uh, which occurred shortly after the, uh, the development of penicillin in the late 40s and 50s. Now, methicillin resistant staph aureus, which we've talked about, and this is due to a chromosomal um, uh, genetic element that uh, confers full resistance by changing in the uh, to the cell wall. There's 
uh, vancomycin, uh, uh, these hetero vancomycin hetero-resistant strains. So this basically, you look on the plate and it looks susceptible, but if you do some additional testing, it's actually it's apparently resistant. We don't know what to do with it. We don't know if it's clinically significant. We don't know what. I just published a paper on, on the, this heterobesa uh, looking at its clinical impact in some of the endocarditis isolates uh, a few, uh, uh, just a month or two ago. And the bottom line is it looks like it, it, uh, it, prob it, it probably is clinically important and it's, it's more common in some parts of the world than others. Like Australia, it was very, very common. Europe, very, very common. The United States, less so. Um, and then two forms of visa the, or vancomycin resistance. Um, I'll leave that out. One of the big issues is this vancomycin minimum inhibitory concentration, vancomycin MIC. So for the people in the trial, this is why we have to do all that vanco MIC data in the trial and collect it and do all this, address it. Because there's real question as to whether the currently accepted susceptibility definitions are good enough. Okay? We don't know. Most people worry that if you get a higher vancomycin MIC, which means technically the drug should still work, but it's right there at the borderline, we really don't know uh, if that has clinical implications or not. There have been a couple of studies to say that it does, and at least one study to say that it doesn't. Um, there now, there's, there's actually been a, a, another one recently that makes the same point. So the bottom, I think it's, it's fair to say People are in equipoise. We don't really know where that goes. Um, Explain a little more about MIC. Okay. Minimum inhibitory concentration. So essentially it's the level of drug. You, you take these, you know, you take the, the drug that you're using, in this case vancomycin, you put the bacteria on it, and you essentially ask the question, what is the lowest concentration of this drug that will inhibit, I think is 90% of the bacteria? And it's, it's a means of measuring how well the drug works against that specific strain that's infecting that individual. Um, so their toxicity, but it's not major issues. Uh, I'll leave this off. I'll leave that off. Daptomycin. Um, so, and, as, you know, in disclosure, I was pretty heavily involved in the registrational trial. Um, well, so this, is a, this was a pretty exciting uh, development in my view, my biased view, um, because it was an alternative to vancomycin. You just can't use vancomycin all the time. And this provided real data, you know, in terms of an FDA indication for Staph aureus bacteremia. That's the first one that, it, you know, in, in, in two decades. Uh, it's, you know, the advantage, but every, like everything else, it's not perfect. Once daily dosing is good, bactericidal is good. It's got FDA approval for staph or bacteremia. The cons, resistance on therapy, resistance to this drug happens. And this is the challenge that we keep running, in, you know, running into with these antibiotics is that it, it's sort of like the, you know, an arms race with the Soviets in the 70s and 80s. You know, this thing just keeps going back and forth and back and forth. And, and uh, I, I don't think it's the answer. Resistance therapy happens. You don't use it in pneumonia, and there are places where it's not approved. Uh, linazolid is another agent. The big thing here is it's orally available. The, the, you know, one of the problems is, and, and it's, and it's a highly available in pneumonia, one of the problems with it is that it's, it can cause, uh, uh, there was this FDA black box warning for concerns about increased mortality in a, in a trial in, in Europe in, the cath, in a cath-related setting. Um, let's see, tigacycline, this is a drug that has been, a, that was recently approved, uh, well, within the last three or four years, um, and has had difficulty finding its true niche in the setting of MRSA infections, um, in large part because of nausea. So pushing 30% of patients who get this get just terrible vomiting and uh, they don't appreciate it and, and uh, nor, you know, <laughs> uh, so it doesn't go real well often uh, and you have to stop the drug. Um, so it's really a drug looking for a home. It, it, its splash has not been quite that 
that I would imagine Wyeth was, was hoping, in, in, in my view. Quinupristin, dalfopristin is a center so this is basically a dead drug. Um, it's very painful to give and to receive. It's very, very expensive, hyper, you know, and, and you, people get it and then they feel like they have the flu. Um, uh, so it's, it's challenging. I use it maybe once or twice a year at most. Um, rifampin, one of the questions in terms of how you treat these sta invasive staph aureus infections is could you use additional drugs um, to kind of help the treatment. And this is sort of voodoo. You know, I, it really, it's like I, it made, you know, it, I, I did it for a while because it made me feel very good when I was treating these patients. You know, it's like, boy, I'm using rifampin. But I don't know what, I, whether it actually helped the patient or not. We really don't have a lot of good data. I mean, that's the reality. It's still, who, who, who knows? Um, community cardia MRSA. This, uh, here goes some epidemiology. Most of the CA MRSA infections that you hear about are skin associated. And uh, there's a whole variety of manifestations. The, this is a different strain, okay? It's, uh, the CA MRSA in the United States is primarily one called the USA 300 clone. And that's basically named because of, of a nomenclature developed in the CDC and the way that it looks on a gel. So what they've done is they've taken Staph aureus and they've broken it up. Uh, they've taken out, extracted its DNA, and then they used things called rest uh, restriction in the nucleases to clip it at certain points where there were se certain sequences, and then ask and then uh, run it on a gel, and uh, to and compare the sizes of the DNA. The point of this slide really is to show here's a bunch of different isolates from a variety of different places. Um, and they're all the same pattern. So there's something, this, this clone has come from essentially being non-existent 15 years ago, 10 years ago, to being the most common cause of skin and soft tissue infection in the United States. It's just exploded. Um, it's different from the hospital form. There are a variety of different ways you can look at that that we won't go into. Uh, occasionally, it can cause real trouble. Two of the things that it's been, have been seen with this, that are reported with this strain is necrotizing fasciitis, which is basically you know, that flesh-eating bacteria thing that you read about in the Inquirer and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and, and then necrotizing pneumonia, where basically you get like necrotizing fasciitis in the lung. Where these, there was a, a, a lady uh, over at UNC last year, you know, it's often after in cases of influenza. And in fact, one of the things that really worried many of the folks in the uh, ID world, including myself, was sort of dual, the, the impact of, of, of uh, simultaneous epidemics, you know, with all the influenza going on and then this MRSA that's expanding. Sorry about that. Thank you, Matt. Um, could that be trouble? Uh, uh, probably a minute. And then um, maybe just call, could you call 684-6854? I'm sorry, Matt. You're the, you're the closest thing to my colleague, so I'm, I'm that, because uh, I've known you the longest, but uh, if you'd be kind enough to like let them know, just tell them that they don't, that I'll go get Matt. I'll walk over and meet the, the resident to interview him at 2 o'clock. Six eight four six eight five four. All right. Um, so there's been some CDC treatment. I think maybe I can leave it off here. Let me see if there's any. I'm not going to go through this. Oh, I will go through this because this part's cool. Human animal transmission. This is pretty neat. This is brand new, and we're just we've got a collaboration with the guys over at NC State. We just met with them yesterday. So MRSA does not just colonize humans, right? So there's this increasing awareness that there's an interplay between humans and path uh, and animals, and so it's pretty clear that uh, MRSA can be transmitted between humans and cattle. 
humans and horses. There was a big outbreak up in uh, Ontario amongst uh, racehorses. These, you know, worth, worth uh, you know several hundreds of thousands of dollars, and their career can be cut short by an, you know, septic arthritis or what have you. Uh, between transmission of uh, staph aureus and dogs and uh, cats. Um, and, and then really most interestingly, pigs. Uh, so there is this, there's been this fascinating phenomenon, this epidemic that's unfolding in Europe and the United States. But here, this is the message. So this, is, this is the Netherlands. Okay, 20, let me just, I'll cut to the, to the key message. 20% of the MRSA in the Netherlands it, it found in humans now, originated from, it, it originated from a pig clone. It's a thing called ST398, and it originated in Dutch pigs, and within just a few years, it's now 20% of the MRSA amongst humans. So there's been cross-species transmission. We're, we, there was a case of, uh, I don't know, a few months ago of a, um, a dog, there was some cardiac lab in the triangle, there was an infection, this MRSA infection in a dog, they wanted to know what the deal was, so we genotyped it, and it was a USA 300, so basically it had transmitted across from humans to, to dogs. Because of this thing, we're doing this study now, which we're just setting up, where we're basically going to ask the question, what's the rate of MRSA colonization of dogs uh, and cats, you know, companion animals, of patients who present with MRSA. So patients who, who are identified through the micro lab, we're going to approach them, ask them, can we go and you know, in, involve them in the study. If they have pets, we're going to go, this is the royal we, uh, we're going to go out to their house and swab their dogs and cats, their noses, and then culture it and ask the question, and then take the isolate from the dog, take the isolate from the human, and then, you know, do the genotyping and ask the question, is it the same or different? So, anyway, so that, we're just starting that. That should be pretty cool. Uh, we, we don't need to do that. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So, in summary, what's the message? The message is Staph aureus is diverse. It's common. Uh, and uh, it is increasingly uh, challenging in terms of its uh, antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. So Vance, can you explain to us uh, what the difference between colonization and infection is? Because, and where do you find Staphylococcus? You know, yeah. is it on your telephone? Is it on your skin? I think it's important for people to understand, uh, you know, what the organism is, where you find it, and and how does it become a pathogen? Sure. So the presence of so basically colonization is the presence of Staph aureus without clinical infection. I mean, the differentiation can sometimes, it seems like it'd be obvious, but it actually can be fairly nuanced. Um, but generally speaking, it's an is the isolation of Staph aureus from a body site uh, in, in, uh, in an individual who is without infection. So in the most common location of such, a, of such colonization is the anterior nares, the nose. So about 25% of people carry around staph aureus in their nose at any time. For example, a few years ago, we swabbed 12% of the Duke undergraduate campus, um, 1,000 noses, because we needed some negative controls for some, uh, that we basically needed isolates that weren't causing infection. And indeed, 27% of those kids um, were carrying staph aureus, completely asymptomatically. Uh, so the most common site is the nose. Um, it, you can also have in other areas, the, the in, uh, skin, axilla, perirectal area, uh, any inner trigonous things where you know, skin folds um, uh, occur. Um, it can, it's, can also contaminate inanimate surfaces. Um, there was a report from Libya uh, about six months ago, uh, that described something like a 10 or 13 percent rate of, uh, is this coming from me, a hooting sound? I'll turn this off and see. Uh, the returned DVDs 
um, at a DVD rental place for colonizing in Marseille. So it's, it's a, you know, now I don't know how they got that study published or funded for that matter, but they, it, you know, there you have it. It, it, it's, it's clear it can sit, it resides on inanimate objects for extended periods of time. It's resistant to heat, it's resistant to, temper, to saline, it's resistant to temperature. Uh, it's a hardy thing. And virtually all people are exposed to staph aureus. Um, you know, all of us have seen it immunologically at some point in our lives. Do you want to talk about the transmission from animals to humans in terms of whether it's direct contact, eating them? Oh, yeah, well... Before know, everybody yeah. throws out the bacon in their freezers tonight. Well, I, don't, I mean, I think you just cook it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't eat it raw. Yeah, don't I think it's important because even when people were talking about swine flu, there was this whole discussion about, you know, should we stop eating pork or uh, no. sh is it direct contact? It's really a direct contact thing. And, you know, I mean, it's not even contact. It's a, you know, I, my guess with this thing is there's going to be, a, there's gonna be a, a sizable minority of, of, uh, of individuals in which where colonization occurs back and forth between the death. Uh, clinically, I, you know, I, and you see it with families, you know, I mean, Dogs and cats aren't that different from little kids, you know. I, and the children, I, the hygiene habits are pretty similar, at least for my children. <laughs> <laughs> for our dog and our hygiene, and the kid, their, you know, their hand washing practices are pretty comparable. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's just there's another reservoir, and it, it, living in a family circle, you know, it, it, close contacts, it's just it's swap back and forth. because you, know, you, know, you get to do this right here, and, you know. Like it's on. Now it's on. All right. Um, yeah. If you can be colonized but not infected, what makes you turn the corner? Immunosuppression or? Oh, that's what? a great question. Uh, there are a lot of reasons. Um, some of them are what we do to people, you know, as a healthcare system. Some are in terms of devices, catheters, things that breach their immune defenses. Some of them are things that they do to themselves. Um, in terms of lifestyle choices, for example, injection drug use and things of that nature uh, is a powerful risk factor for it. Diabetes uh, is a risk factor for it. Um, and uh, some of them is probably the hand you're dealt in terms of your genetic hand. There is, it's pretty clear there's a genetic predisposition to, like many of these things, to susceptibility to these infections. In fact, one of my my sort of other research effort is uh, 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 in, in the lab and basically looking at the question of why do some people with staph aureus get bad infection, others don't. It's pretty clear. I mean, we've demonstrated that certain ma strains of mice uh, are more resistant to staph aureus than others. And in fact, we've localized four genes that uh, are, appear to be associated with wimpiness, you know, to staph aureus. Um, so... So it's it's a, it's going to be you know sort of the classic complex disease. Uh, they're, they're environmental factors, and there's going to be ho there's going to be host genetic factors. So breaks in the skin. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Right, good point. Thank you, Ethel. So keep your skin well uh, lotioned during the winter months. She's bringing you a mic. There was talk a couple years ago, and I don't know if it's still ongoing or not that some hospitals were actually doing nasal swabs for people that were admitted to the hospital to see yes. if they were colonized when they came in. Is that still going on, and what do you think about that? Good question. Uh, it, is not, it is not at this time going on. I suspect that's about to change. 
the reason I say that is that uh, I have it under fairly good um, understanding that there's a paper in press in New England Journal, uh, like really good understand uh, 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 perspective. There's a paper in the New England Journal from a randomized controlled trial conducted in, in uh, Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands at Erasmus University addressing just that issue. Um, it, the, the challenge in the past has been time to know. So in other words, it took, it took so long to get the answer back because of conventional diagnostics that by the time you knew, it's three days later and now what are you going to do, right? But that window of uncertainty has been closed considerably with newer diagnostic approaches, um, genetic-based uh, diagnostic approaches that can uh, reduce the time to knowing carriage status dramatically. And then if you can um, act upon that data through some kind of decolonization protocol that, for example, these guys in Erasmus did, um, they, I think, showed that it's helped. So my, so the answer, short answer is no, not yet, but I suspect it will be, the question will be readdressed at the very least in the near future with the publication of that paper. What are you going to do with those people? Do you put them all on vancomycin? I mean, what would uh, you do? Yeah, that's, that's fair enough. Um, you, they're colonized, so at that point the issue is really de reducing the rate of staph aureus in the skin. Um, it's, this has been tested in multiple randomized control trials, I should say, you know, in the fairness. In fact, in 2008, there were two of them, one in JAMA and one in uh, Annals, that, so basically high-end journals that, that had more or less contradictory data. <clears throat> um, but what you would do with them, in essence, would be some sort of, decolon some sort of decolonization attempt that would be uh, characterized by... Um, Interventions to reduce the carriage in the nose, interventions to reduce carriage in your skin. If they were if they're colonized with MRSA, you could go ahead and put them on contact isolation right up, right away, which was, would be a very imp important intervention from the standpoint of transmission to other patients. Um, and uh, with the goal being to reduce your sort of the burden of staph aureus that that particular individual is carrying. That's why a lot of times if you're going to the hospital to have a procedure, the doctor will tell you to take two or three days of Hippoclans, yeah. take a couple of showers before. And they're, what their objective is is to reduce at least the person's, uh, their own uh, staphylococcal, uh, call, you know, how many how many, how much staphylococci they have on them as well. You know, they'll yeah. tell you to take a shower, wash your hair. Um, and make sure that you do it like two or three times before you come in for the surgery. So that's one of the ways in which uh, people try to prevent hospital-acquired infections because it's not always the fact that the doctor did it to you. Sometimes just the fact that you have it on you and then fact the fact that they're doing the intervention causes your own bugs to kind of get into the yeah, surgical right. wound. Yeah. That's exactly and it's an important right. distinction to make because it's not always, oh, gee, it must be the surgical team. Uh, often it's the person's own bacteria that they're becoming infected with during the procedure. So it's just a, a little distinction to make. It's not always true. I did have one case when I was doing infection control, and I looked at five infections, uh, five bacteremias post uh, surgical uh, in surgery and the same surgeon, we found out that this guy, the surgeon, he wasn't very happy with me, he was also the director of the ICU, that he had a terrible skin infection in his leg and, uh, you know, which was covered by his greens and we actually restricted him from the OR until it cleared up and we actually uh, found that in fact it was the same bug that he was carrying that was in the patient. So. Um, it's not always the case, but it does happen. Oh yeah, no. There's a there's a, a really interesting uh, interplay between the host and the pathogen, and and for example, there's a, there's a phenomenon described as cloud babies. In fact, this was described in the early 1960s uh, amongst uh, in, in neonatal intensive care units, uh, where uh, one child would have been, been a, have acquired Staph aureus, usually through contact with his parent, uh, and then they noticed that all the babies within like sometimes a 15 foot radius of that one uh, would acquire it and, and essentially 
than what uh, what Bob uh, Sherritts did over at Wake Forest a few years ago <coughs> was show that not only are there child ba uh, uh, cloud babies, but cloud adults, where he essentially found this surgery resident and they had had multiple episodes of infections. They gave this guy a rhinovirus. They gave him a you know a cold, common cold, and then they measured the dispersion of Staph aureus before and after he had the cold. And he, more or less, even with the mask on, more or less just, I don't know, it was like a cloud of Staph aureus around him. He put culture plates all over the room, and, and, and when he was sick, he actually grew Staph aureus, they, they grew the Staph aureus. So, and, and there are only some individuals that do that. So there's a whole, so there's a genetic component there. There's a, there's, you know, you think Staph aureus, kind of like malaria. Staph aureus and, you know, and malaria and TB. I mean, these are pathogens that, it, that we as, as, a, as a species have been interacting with for millennia. You know, hundreds and thousands of years, probably millions of years. And um, so it's impossible. It would be very naive to think that, that, that it hasn't had some sort of fingerprint. It's left a fingerprint on the host, you know, human uh, gen genomics. Uh, for you know, an example of that, sickle cell disease in uh, malaria. So you know, it's five percent of the African American population amongst amongst Africans. When I, I, sp I spent a year doing malaria research in Tanzania, up in the Highlands and this Highland rainforest, and um, it's it, it's protective. It's highly protective. Sickle cell trait amongst um, uh, amongst indigenous Africans uh, was highly protective from malaria. You almost never saw it, and when you did see it, it was very mild. Um, uh, and by contrast, their counterparts, sometimes people in the same, you know, household, would get malaria, and they'd be just sicker than hell. Oh, sorry, they'd be very sick. Um, <laughs> so, anyway. Other <coughs> questions? Pat, please. Um, Dr. Fowler, you mentioned that a lot of us are walking around with um, staph aureus in our nasal cavities. So is there a way to um, bring those colonization numbers down, such as like using a neti pot to clean out your nasal passages? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, what I tell you, I mean, I, the thing I do know and that I would recommend is alcohol hand wash. You know, just those big old Purell, big old jugs you can get at Sam's. They're cheap. <clears throat> I, absolutely, none of not that distance, the soaps, all the distance, because they, 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 the resistance has already been has already been clearly demonstrated <clears throat> in Staph aureus and other pathogens to those antibacterials hand washing. That's good for like manually, mechanically disrupting the bacteria, getting them off the skin. But in terms of actually killing bacteria, nothing beats alcohol hand wash and. Uh, I've got no vested in. I got no dog in the fight on that. But I can tell you, we got a big jug of it at home, and I make sure all the little, the little people when they come in, you know, not again, daddy. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, so alcohol handles because there's been no resistance described in that, and I really do think it works. Not just for 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 staph aureus, but for common cold and you know all sorts of things. It's just a good thing. For those of you that have these little dispensers of whatever soap you have, and then you keep filling it up, you know, topping up is not a good idea because soap can become colonized. So if you're going to use these little sub, you need to make sure you empty it, wash it out really well before you, you know, when you go to Sam's Club and you get the really big one, just make sure and you pour it into the little ones after. Just make sure that you don't keep topping it up. It's like, you know, when you go to a buffet and they keep just adding to it, the bugs are at the bottom. So just remember that a lot of the soaps, I mean, we, we used to culture the soap dispensers and found uh, actually lots of bugs in the soap dispensers. So, you know, you just have to be conscious that you're, you know, empty the little soap dispenser, wash it out really well, wash it out with alcohol before you pour it in from that big jug that you get at Sam's Club because you may just be actually recolonizing yourself when you wash your hands. So, you know, just something to take into consideration. Dr. Fowler? Right here. Yes, ma'am. So basically, I think you um, hit that area earlier. So basically, is it safe to say that the chronic sinus um, sufferer, that comes up under the same heading? 
Not quite. You know, chronic sinusitis is, um, it's a real, that's a tough nut to crack, you know, as, as uh, you know, folks who, who un unfortunately have to, to experience it know much better than I. It's, and usually, um, I mean, it's a whole bunch of different path bacteria that can get involved in it. Um, and uh, often you gotta, you know, ultimately you have to do some sort of surgical drainage or something. It's a tough one. Even when you do that, you don't always clear it up. So it's a, it's a tough one. I'm a candidate. Yeah, it's a tough one. There. Yeah, it is. <coughs> Another question, sorry. Um, do you get used to your own staff, but someone else's staff might not be <laughs> something you can tolerate? Like you could reuse yeah. your own towel, but not someone else's? Uh, yeah, I mean, the towel thing is probably a good idea. Um, you know, it's interesting that the, the New England Journal, you know, there was, this, there was a really, actually a really neat New England Journal paper from the St. Louis Rams uh, in 2005. Uh, there was an outbreak of MRSA in these football players, and um, four or five of them in the same team within more or less the same period. And so they, they went in and did a case control study and started, and one of the things they looked at was the number of times, I mean, these guys are, you know, they're multi-million dollar salaries and all. So the number of times the average towel was used uh, in, the, in the locker room. So they were trying to figure out, and so they, they did their thing. And so long story short, the, the average number of towel, people that use a towel was four and, um, in the locker. And then once, that was one of the first sort of early interventions that, you know, they enacted and, and, um, it, and it, it helped. Uh, in terms of your question about, you know, the difference, or is, it, is there a host pathogen um, uh, bonding or, or uh, affinity? And I think the answer is, uh, you, 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 believe it or not, you probably so, particularly for, well, yes and no. For certain types of folks, you can become what they call a long-term carrier and that people car will carry have ongoing carriage uh, for decades sometimes. The interesting thing is, is it's usually the same strain. So if you go in, if they have one strain, and you check them a year later, it's going to be the same strain. You check them a year later, it's going to be the same strain. In fact, you, if they actually have it interrupted where there's a transient, temporarily there's one another strain, and then they, it, they tend to, to revert back to their specific clone. Um, and why that is, who, you know, is not yet known. The, the Dutch are really leading the scientific efforts at this point on how the host and staph aureus interact in terms of nasal carriage. But there's clearly an interplay. So our time is approaching the end. And I, uh, so before everybody goes off to do a Hibitane shower, and decolonize their nasal passages. <laughs> I wanted to really thank uh, Dr. Fowler for coming and uh, enlightening us about Staphylococci since, you know, bugs are our friends and we live with them all the time. So thank you very much. It was really great and I know everyone appreciated it. And you thank you all again for coming and uh, we have lots more interesting uh, sessions this year. Great. Thanks.